NOIG's Thriving in Your Sub-I panel. My name is Philip. I'm the NOIG president this year. Um, and this is our first event of the year. So we're really excited to have you all here. Thanks to everyone for joining us and a special thank you to our panelists for being here to share their wisdom. So before we get started, I just wanna mention a few NOIG resources briefly. So if you're not a student member yet, you can register on our website, headmirror.com slash NOIG. This will add you to our newsletter. You can stay up to date with opportunities from NOIG and from other groups that we promote. You can also register your school's interest group there. And lastly, if you need otolaryngology mentorship, please consider joining our mentorship program. We have dozens of mentors across the country who are willing to advise interested students. And some of our panelists today are even mentors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Preetha, our Chair of Education. Great, so welcome everyone. Um, today we have an impressive panel of three attending physicians and four residents who will be providing their valuable insight on how we as medical students can succeed on our otolaryngology sub I and away rotations. This panel will be one hour total. Shannon, who is our vice president, will be compiling audience questions. So feel free to directly message her via the chat function um, if you have any questions that we don't address. And then we will get to them at the end if we have time. Um, and we will also be recording this panel and uploading it later to Headmirror. So with that, let's start with some introductions. Um, starting off, we have Dr. Cabrera Muffley, who is a general otolaryngologist and associate professor at a program in the West, where she has been the residency program director for four years. And then up hey, next. Everybody. Up next, we have Dr. De Silva, who is a laryngologist, associate professor, and vice chair of education at a program in the Midwest, where he has been program director for 11 years. Thanks, everyone. And then we have Dr. Platt, who is a rhinologist and associate professor and has been program director of a residency program on the East Coast since 2016. All right, thanks for having me. And then for our resident panelists, we have Dr. Heslop, who is a PGY4 at a program out west. Hi, everybody. And then we have Dr. Miller, who is also a PGY4 at a program on the west coast. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. And um, we have Dr. Gutierrez, who is a PGY3 at a program on the East Coast. Hey, everyone. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Swift, who is a PGY2 at a program on the West Coast. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So um, we, again, want to say a huge thank you to our panelists for their time on this Saturday. And I know I am very excited to hear from all of them. And their great advice. I also want to say a huge thank you to our audience members for tuning in today. Um, and on that note, we can go ahead and get started with our questions. So one of the main things that I and many of my peers think about is um, what specific characteristics make a strong or honors level medical student. So we can start off with Dr. De Silva for this question. Thanks, Brita. Thanks for having me on this uh, webinar. I'm excited to join all the great people here. Um, you know, I think uh, the easy answer is being prepared and engaged, um, and that sounds obvious, but uh, that means different things to different people, I think. And sometimes it's hard to do when you're at a new institution if you're doing an away rotation. So how can you be prepared and engaged? I think being on time and helping the team, obviously with rounds in the morning, whatever their expectations are, I think understanding those expectations up front is really helpful. So don't be afraid to ask what was, you know, what's expected of me? How can I help? How can I, you know, be the best, you know, team player, you know, coming to rounds each day, coming to clinic. From a faculty perspective, I, I love it when a medical student has been prepared for clinic. So if they've, you know, they have access to our electronic medical record, if they can look at that, you know, clinic scheduled the night before or the morning of, understand who the new patients are. They, they get to do more in the clinic when they know 
you know, why they're coming in, maybe if they've had previous imaging or biopsies or whatever it, it be, I'm certainly going to feel more comfortable and know that they're engaged and knowing about the patients, let them do more. You know, I'm, as a laryngologist, I'll let them do the telescope exam, so do the endoscopy, the stroboscopy, the fees, those types of things, depending on their comfort level. And hopefully by the end of the clinic, they've done several. So, you know, I, I want to get them involved. And so if they show that interest up front, I, it's going to be a really great day for both of us. Um, from an operative experience, I think uh, understanding the surgery schedule ahead of time. Again, if you're at a new institution, you've never been there, it can be hard to navigate that initially. But as soon as you pick up speed, I think it's great if you can come to that surgery, understanding why the patient had the surgery, the anatomy involved, what are some of the surgical options and how we're going to do that. Uh, you know, talking to the resident ahead of time, you know, I've read about a couple of different surgical approaches. What are we doing for this? So if you're prepared, you're engaged, you're more likely to answer questions correctly. You're more likely to get to do, do more in the surgery. Um, you know, endoscopies and things like that are certainly fair game for fourth year students from my perspective in the operating room too. So, um, so I, I like, you know, initiating those experiences if the, if the medical student is ready to, ready to learn. Great, thank you, Dr. Tisola. That was a great overview of kind of the different areas that students can be um, prepared for and be able to shine. If anyone else has any thoughts on this question, I would like to open um, what kind of things do you look out for in an uh, honors level medical student? I can chime in from the resident side. I think as a medical student, it's really easy to say, what can I help with? But I think you really have to go that extra mile of paying attention to what's happening on rounds and giving residents ideas of how they can help. Because if you just say, can I help? As a resident, we're really tired. We just kind of want to finish things. And we don't really know what you mean by that. But if you say, hey, tomorrow morning, could I present this patient when we do group rounds? Or, hey, I saw that this case needs to be posted. Like, is there anything that you want me to do to communicate to the nurses? So like giving really concrete examples of how you can help out the team. And the resident will tell you whether or not that is or isn't okay. And then they'll tell you, well, maybe don't do that, but you can do this instead. And so I think just having that conversation with residents about how you can possibly help with concrete examples opens up what you're willing to do and also gives the residents ideas of what you can do as a medical student. And having that medical student that helps on rounds and can really add to the team is awesome. We love it as residents. Something that I really respect in medical students is um, when I see that they are kind of kind to patients, respectful to patients, and just watching them interact with patients in a pleasant way, and making sure they don't forget that this is about humanity, um, also about science, but um, don't forget the patient part of all of this. I think that's certainly something that people will respect. Kind of in a similar vein to that, I think um, when I've seen uh, sub eyes that also work well with the other their co sub eyes and like lift each other up. That's um, kind of a beneficial thing, knowing that we're all on the same team ultimately, and um, wanting everyone to kind of succeed is something I always admire when I see that in sub eyes. Great. Thank you all for those responses. Um, so kind of um, branching off of that a little bit, how can applicants without home otolaryngology programs best prepare for away rotations? And we can start off with Dr. Heslop for this question. Yeah, I went to a medical school that didn't have an ENT program. And because of that, I had to kind of reach out to people in uh, programs that were across the country, but also reach out to residents uh, across the country, just looking, looking at their programs or talking to people and trying to get connected with people, just networking. Also, if you have a, a program that is close by your institution, even if it's not an institution where you're actually rotating, you can always reach out to the, the faculty there and see if there's anything that you can do to get some kind of makeshift rotation there. I thought that that was very helpful for me. Um, and then, you know, just you have to have the confidence to know that 
even though you don't have a home rotation, you'll be able to learn uh, pretty quickly and uh, get up to speed pretty quickly. And so maybe your first away rotation won't be your best, but um, you can certainly get up to speed and, and be uh, a better performer for your second and third if you choose to do that many. Okay, great. So now transitioning a little bit to the topic of rounds, what are the expectations of a medical student on rounds and how can a student stand out in this setting? We'll start off with Dr. Gutierrez. What are your thoughts on this question? I think the most important thing is to never assume anything as a medical student. Every institution is drastically different. I did two aways and one was on the East Coast, one was on the West Coast and I was going to med school in the Midwest and just the culture between all three programs was drastically different. Um, and honestly, the culture on the East Coast was that sub eyes were treated more as this is a learning experience for you and more of an observership. And they really didn't feel comfortable having medical students uh, really doing a lot of things to patients. But because of that, then there's a lot more emphasis on your presentation, on how you were preparing the list and then on the West Coast, it was very different where I was supposed to be incredibly engaged with patients and helping with dressing changes and having all the supplies. So I think it just kind of goes back to really be open and communicate with the residents asking, what are you comfortable with me doing on rounds? Would you like me to make the list? Do you want me to present? And the most important thing is to not be offended when they say, no, I actually don't want you to do this because sometimes you're really eager and you want to come in and do everything and just do the best you can. But it's really easy to, to think that the person is giving you negative feedback, but it's not. It's just the culture of that program and what they see medical students as doing. So it's just important to take whatever they tell you, understand that it's just different at every program. Um, so at our program, for example, at UVA, our medical students, we have them present at rounds, but I know that sometimes the chiefs will often forget and they'll just be kind of going through. And then certain medical students will be like, oh, I didn't you know, want to interrupt. But you also have to advocate for yourself and say like, oh, you know, Dr. So-and-so or however you talk to your chief resident, like, is it okay if I present this patient? Like there's ways to be polite and having talked with your residents to still participate um, in your sub I. So I think that's the hardest part with rounds is just figuring out what the expectations are and how to and how to kind of mold yourself to that program. But it's easy to do if you just ask. Great. Yeah, Thank I also, you. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna chime in really quick. I totally agree with everything um, Dr. Gutierrez said. Um, additionally, I think it's really nice when the sub eyes have pre-rounded on their patients. Um, just, you know, if you operated on that patient, you don't have to, you know, pre-round on everyone. That's probably impossible, but at least for the two or three patients you operated on the prior day, um, to just go check in on them early, see how they're doing. Oftentimes you can actually like gain little pearls that maybe the intern overnight didn't even hear about. Um, maybe they're having nausea or something that the team wasn't alerted to. And so if you can just, you know, you know, get a little bit of uh, extra information from them before the whole team goes to see them, that can be really helpful. Something that I always find helpful kind of going back to being prepared is a certain level of anticipation. So if you know this patient every day, we're changing their zero form dressing, having that at the bedside can be, you know, ahead of time can be really helpful or um, things like that, small things that you know, like you're that clearly show that you've paid attention, you know, kind of what the plan is for this patient, kind of what what things might be needed to help the team that that can be really helpful. And building on all that great advice, what specific supplies should medical students be prepared to have on rounds? Um, I'd say, you know, similar to what Dr. Swift had mentioned, picking up on what we're doing every day for certain patients um, and having those supplies, but then always having gauze, Curlex, um, suture removal kit. I don't know how every institution is a little bit different, but we have a supply bag that usually the sub I or the med student will carry around. And so um, making sure that supply bag is always restocked at the end of every day or at the beginning of the day. Um, and then, you know, there's always going to be a time where we need something that we didn't anticipate. And so just being willing to run to the supply room um, and help us grab something if we're in the middle of a dressing change. Um, 
And then, oh, pen lights are crucial. Everyone should have a pen light. Um, if you can afford it, I would splurge on like, a, you know, one of the brighter ones. Don't just grab one from the supply room because those are very dim in general. Um, I mean, it can be like $10 on Amazon, but just something that's, you know, that you can always have in your pocket and the senior residents will really appreciate it. Also like tongue depressors are always good to have. Um, and then also like 25 gauge needles, if you have flap service would be helpful. Lubrication, alcohol swabs, that kind of stuff is always good to have a little hanging around. Great, thank you all. Um, so transitioning a little bit to the clinic setting now, um, Given the wide variety of expectations and experiences at different institutions with clinic, what is the best way for medical students to prepare? And Dr. Platt, I would love to hear your thoughts on this question. Thanks. I think that all medical students have access to the medical records. And if you can look at the list of patients the following day and see what type of problems they have, you will be so well ready to just shine. You can look and see what patients are coming, what their problems are. You can read about their histories and know them really well, but also you can read about their diseases. And uh, that's such a crucial part of your rotation, spending time with attendees in clinic. When you really know your patients, and most of the questions I ask come from those patients, they're not just random patients, you could be extremely well prepared by reading about those topics. And even if it's a very rare topic, the attending will be very impressed if they bring up a very rare topic and all of a sudden you know everything about it. And how do you know? Because you looked at the clinic schedule for the next day. So I think that's one way you could definitely prepare to shine by lots of reading the night before and by scanning the chart and finding out what you're going to be seeing the next day. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pot. And kind of building upon that, um, how can students give strong and efficient presentations in clinic? And Dr. Cabrera Muffley, I would love to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, I think this varies uh, again from program to program, um, but I think asking your, your the faculty you're working with um, beforehand, you know, what do you want me to concentrate on in my presentation? Um, they'll give you a couple, you know, tips. And also, if you can, watching uh, the residents present in clinic is super helpful, and then you can tailor your presentations that way. Going off of what Dr. Cabrera said, I think it's really easy as a sub I to try to want to jump in and do everything. But take the time to, for example, if it's a new clinic and if for whatever reason you never did laryngology or rhinology and you're in that new clinic, don't be afraid to just go with the resident and say, hey, is it okay if I see the first couple of patients with you? Because then you'll see what the resident gets from the patient and kind of understand what that attending expects. And then you see based on the history you took and then how that resident turns it into a presentation, what that attending is expecting. I know that I would do that on certain rotations where I am a more eager person and I would just jump in and then I'd say, I have no idea what history is important. And then my presentation would not be as concise as it could have been if I had just taken that time to jump in with a resident for the first two clinic visits. I think it's just so important to be humble and understand that you're not gonna know everything and that's okay. And I think we've talked about this multiple times, but asking early on for kind of anything, but especially this can be really helpful. Ask the resident, you know, every attending is different. Some attendings want really brief presentations and it might depend on the patient. If this is a well-established patient that they know really well and they just want the like, you know, like important updates that can be helpful to know or whether they want a full kind of a traditional presentation. So just asking early on what, what they would like and how you can, uh, you know, best tailor your presentation to what they want, I think is never wrong, especially to start the day. It's always reasonable too to ask, uh, if you do go in with a resident, um, or even if you don't, to ask the resident, hey, is it okay if I present this patient to you very quickly, just to, to make sure I'm not missing anything? Um, depending on, I mean, you have to gauge the clinic, like if it's extremely busy and maybe it's not a good time to do that, then don't do it. But 
um, it's possible that that practice might help you and the resident can give you pointers and then you can present it to the attending. Great, so those were all great tips for the clinic setting and kind of how to um, get the expectations early on and prepare. So what now transitioning to the OR, um, what are expectations of medical students in the OR and more specifically, how can we prepare for questions? And I'll direct this question to Dr. Miller. Yeah, so I think um, once you're now on your sub I, you've definitely moved up from being an M3. I think the expectation as an M3 is just try not to get in the way and don't contaminate the sterile field. Now we assume that you all know not to do that. Um, but I mean, if, if you really didn't get much out of your M3 clerkship and you don't know how to scrub or something, uh, of course, I would definitely ask a resident or, or the attending. Um, but, you know, we assume that all of you know how to do that by now. Um, and so it is really helpful for you coming into the OR to be prepared. Um, and, you know, we expect that you've read about the patient. You should know, you know, age, gender of the patient at a very minimum, and then their history, why we're there, why we're doing the surgery, um, and then common implications, like um, reason, other reasons you might be doing that surgery, just, you know, general, probably what you did as an M3 as well. Um, but then we will expect you to know more of the anatomy. So I would just start every case by going back to netters, um, looking at your, textbook and just reviewing the anatomy of whatever case you're going to do. Um, and then there are so many different resources and it's impossible for you to go through all of them. So I would say try to really focus and find a couple that you like. Um, when I was a sub I, I found the like the South Africa um, Odo Atlas, which if you just Google South Africa ENT or something, it will come up. It's the first thing. Um, they have lots of uh, just step by step, like the steps that you need for a bunch of different surgeries that I thought was really helpful. Um, sometimes it's different than what we do now because um, you know it's supposed to be for a limited resource um, setting where you can um, use the techniques that they talk about, but in general, it still reviews the anatomy and it's really helpful. Um, it seems like Head Mirror actually has a bunch of great resources now. Um, I didn't have that when I was a sub I, but I've looked at the website a little bit. Um, and there are some great surgical videos. I used to, well, I still do just YouTube a lot of the time as well. Um, if you can't find it on Head Mirror or if it's like a very niche surgery that you know isn't on there, if you YouTube it, sometimes you can find some really great some really great videos. Um, what else? Oh, one thing that I used to do is if it's a surgery that um, is a little bit unique. Sometimes I would go on PubMed and type in the attending's name and see if they've published um, or if they write about that certain surgery or, you know, that disease process, because chances are you're going to your sub eye at a place that's very academic and um, the faculty there are often very well known in the field. Um, and so to be able to look at what kind of research they've done, um, that can help you generate questions in the OR and really uh, facilitate an interesting discussion. And then, you know, obviously they're going to like it that you prepared and read um, beyond just the basics. It's kind of taking it one step further. So I think that can be helpful. Um, and yeah, those are, the, I mean, there's lots of textbooks. You can go to Bailey's, um, Myers, but I don't think as a sub I, you need to necessarily get buy all of those textbooks. I think just there's a lot of stuff that's free online. Um, that you can use. And then once you're a resident, then you can use your ed, like educational funds to buy all the um, big textbooks. There's also a book called ENT Secrets, which can be super helpful. It just has a bunch of questions. Um, it's like question answer form, and it's a good way to kind of like prepare based on your case or disease process ahead of time for the case. So you can just go through the chapter pretty quickly the night before, maybe look into it a little bit more in the morning, and then kind of have kind of these predetermined questions that you already have the answers to ahead of time. I was seeing if I had mine. I think it's on my bookshelf. Um, my like secret, if you're super rushed tip is to find an op note, like an op note template or an op note for a very similar procedure that's happened before because the op note documents all the critical steps of the surgery. And that is what the attending is gonna ask you about because they wanna make sure that you understand what, what are we doing right now? Like, why do we need to find this structure? And usually you're never gonna see the structure they're trying not to hurt. 
And so, but in the opnodal detail, we then carefully reflected this to avoid injuring this, or we moved this structure out of the way. So I think finding an opno, I don't know who taught me that, some resident taught me that. And that's such a nice little way to pick up on what are really the important steps because learning anatomy is one thing, but then learning the surgically relevant anatomy, I think is really hard as a sub I and really hard as a first and second year resident. There's also video sites that you can go to that are narrated videos of the surgery and sinusvideos.com is one that my mentor had put together that's completely free and you could go in there watch the entire surgery complicated or simple sinus surgeries or skull based surgeries and know every step of the surgery narrated before you see it the following day and i've also looked at youtube and just searched for different types of special surgeries and i found lots of good videos on there I'll just add piggyback onto all of that is I, I like to ask students about uh, potential complications. So, because I think you're preparing for your intern year and you're going to be consenting patients, of course. So um, I ask probably less about anatomy and more about, you know, what are some of the other options for this patient? You know, you have a subglottic stenosis patient, you know, what are some of the, you know, clinic options or other treatment options we do? And then also uh, what are some of the complications that can happen during this surgery? Um, so you can kind of pre be prepared for that too. So think about those things because you're going to be consenting those patients and, and thinking about that when you're talking to these patients in, in the coming months. Great. That was all very helpful advice on preparing for the OR. I think uh, another area that students are often um, have a lot of questions about is how, what are the expectations for our technical skills and how we can prepare for, um, prepare for the OR at a sub-I level. So I would love to hear from some of our attending physicians. Maybe you can start off with Dr. De Silva for this question. Sure, I, I don't have a lot of expectations for technical skills in the operating room, uh, frankly. Um, you know, we talked a little about a basic understanding of, um, you know, setup for the OR and being safe and such. Um, for open neck cases, bigger cases, we hope that you understand how to retract, how to help move the case along, understanding kind of what the goals of the surgery are. So seeing some of those videos ahead of time can understand, you know, where you may want to put your retractor, how you can kind of move with the attending or move with the resident physician to uh, gain that great exposure. Um, suturing is something that we expect you to understand, at least basic understanding. Um, at this point and not tying, of course, how to cut ties um, and also, you know, when to bovie or suction appropriately where you're not in the way, but you're also helpful. So those things are, are important. If you have skills that you've learned, I'd like to know about it because I may let you take that next step. So if you've done a laryngoscopy, a bronchoscopy, let's have you try it. I'm going to let you do that surgery. We've had students do tonsillectomies and ear tube insertions. If if you know how to clear, clean out the ear, let's have you clean out the ear first before we do the tympanoplasty, those kinds of things. Very similar to, off, as a laryngologist, we do a lot of office-based procedures. So if you understand how to do a laryngoscopy and you've done five of them on your previous rotation, well, let's do an awake bronch today. So communicate with me on some of the things you've done before and that you'd love to learn how to do. And, and I'm hopeful that you'll learn that. You'll just be a better intern if you've done it several before, um, you know, before you graduate from medical school. So I don't have a lot of expectations, but I'd love to know about skills you've already developed and maybe we can take that next step. Same goes for rhinology. So if you know how to do nasal endoscopy, you know, maybe we start the case with you doing the nasal endoscopy and showing us your skills that way. It's a way to shine. Yeah, I'll echo that. I don't really have a lot of expectations. And the key thing is don't let your fear of not being good at it the first time um, make you not want to, you know, asked to do it. Uh, we, we don't expect you to be good the first time you do it. So, you know, if we can see progress over the course of the rotation, that's way more valuable because then you're teachable. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to go ahead and try something, even if it's the first time you do it. I also don't have many expectations with the one exception of suturing. You know, I do mostly endoscopic surgery. And so I like to teach students how to use an endoscope and how to suction throughout the sinuses, but I don't expect anyone to know that. Suturing is a little bit different. I think most of the students get in head and neck rooms, get in facial plastics rooms. Um, 
patients come in on call that have big lacerations. I think that's an opportunity where you could be prepared. You could buy pig's feet at the grocery store. They're very inexpensive. We have unlimited suture material that students and residents practice on, as well as instruments made for this. And I think that ahead of time, you could practice on your own, sewing with pig's feet, knowing how to tie knots with two hands, with one hand, good surgeon's knots, and that you could really shine if you come in there and already know how to sew. And for our resident physicians, how did you prepare for technical skills on your away rotations? Was it just a lot of watching YouTube videos and practicing or any specific tips? I mean, I think practicing knot tying is something that you can do at home. I mean, even if you don't have kind of, if even if you're not kind of in a position to use like pig's feet, for example, you could still have like some silk ties and just practice on like, you know, your pants or practice on like a, uh, like a Coke can that you just use or practice on just like anything you can tie to just practice tying to it, you know, in the middle of like a lecture, just like you can start making an automatic, automatic process for you, something that just, you're just doing in your, in your spare time. Um, and then also like, having an instrument in your hand, like using a disposable needle, needle driver and like practicing kind of opening it and closing it and just feeling comfortable maneuvering with the needle driver in your hand is gonna be something that is very, very uh, important in the OR. I think it's really easy to get intimidated with using certain instruments if the person you're learning from looks really different from you. I'm five foot one and my glove size is a six. And a lot of times the surgical interest group would be mostly guys who are like 6'2 that are teaching us how to do things. Um, similarly, we would have these intubation workshops with ED residents that were really buff. Um, I would say try to find people that look like you if you are having difficulty with that and not be afraid. Like I can still intubate, I can still do everything that those residents can do. Um, I remember thinking that I could never palm an instrument because my hand was too small and then that just wasn't the case. Um, so again, just taking that time to practice and figuring out how to hold instruments in a way that work for you. And if you're struggling with that, finding someone that looks like you that can show you a different way to do it. Yeah, I would say um, at my med school, we had a surgery interest group, which actually was super helpful. And that's how I learned how to suture, you know, when I was a first year med student, um, they had these little kits that we could use. Um, but if your school doesn't have that, I think you can you know, you can always buy them on Amazon or something, but also the ERs often have um, disposable lac trays, which I'm not saying to go steal from the ER, but if you happen to find one lying around, no one would notice. Um, so there's lots of ways to get resources. Um, and I do think it is the expectation that, you know, you'll have at least practiced a little bit at home. And so you can, when you're in the OR, if we give you the opportunity to um, close at the end of the case, it would be, um, you know, a little bit, uh, not upsetting, but discouraging if you just like didn't know how to do anything. It's okay if you fumble a little bit. Um, we don't expect you to be perfect, but if you were just like, oh, I don't, I don't know how to sew, then you know, we're probably not going to be able to take the extra time to teach you all of the steps of suturing um, at the end of a case. But if you already know kind of the basic steps, then that's really helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of those skills are it's kind of similar to playing a sport. It's about the number of repetitions, getting as many as you can. So just palming a needle you know, as much as you can at home, finding anything like I, I, had, I had recommended and someone said to use like Krillax when you're suturing, like if you can't get pig's feet using anything, but then if you're able to really practicing kind of under similar conditions, like I remember when I was starting, I would feel pretty good about tying and then I'd be double gloved, my hands would be, you know, a little slippery and have trouble gloved up. So if at home, if you have an extra pair of gloves, throwing them on while, while you practice, things like that to try and recreate the situation as much as possible when the, when, you know, everyone's watching you and under that real situation, if you're able to, that, that can help a little bit as well too. Great. Thank you all for that advice and for the discussion so far. So we have heard a lot of tips about how to perform well in different settings during our rotations. Um, now I wanted to transition a little bit to talk about the latter half of an away rotation and kind of wrapping things up. So um, 
at the end of our rotations, we often have a presentation that we give to the department. So what are some tips for how to be successful on our end of rotation presentations? And we'll start off with Dr. Swift for this question. Yeah, I think um, that's a huge opportunity um, to really um, show kind of what you've learned and also your, your knowledge base and your presenting skills. Um, everyone's gonna be watching. I think things that I did that I found really helpful is first of all, trying to identify your topic early on and really get your presentation um, put together as much as possible. Um, identifying both a faculty mentor who can help you with it so that they can help you kind of help guide you and uh, know kind of what would be valuable to talk about. And then also uh, practicing it as much as possible. A lot of the, I had uh, when I was on my sub I, uh, one of the residents, I, I, a couple times she helped me. I was able to like go through my presentation entirely a couple times with her and get feedback. So really practicing it, having it down and then having both resident and faculty input on how you can really um, make it shine as much as possible, I think is helpful. Yeah, I agree. Kind of the earlier you get it done, the better, um, because that gives people time to kind of in a relaxed fashion, go over it and provide you with any feedback so that you can make the appropriate edits and then uh, give a good presentation at the end of the day. Um, so just trying to get it done as early as possible and get as much feedback as possible from people. I would just like to add, if you do two rotations, it's worthwhile doing a different topic the second time around. And the reason for that um, is not just more work for you, but it's an opportunity to learn a new topic. If you can teach something or talk about it for 15 minutes, we all know that you're gonna understand it a lot better, but it's an opportunity to engage with a faculty member at a really you know, close level. So if you had an interesting case first week and you asked that faculty member, hey, this was really interesting to me. I'd love to use this as a topic for my presentation at the end of the rotation. You're gonna to get to know that attending a little bit better because you're gonna to talk to them a couple of times, you're gonna send them your slides maybe, and they're gonna get an understanding of your, uh, your work ethic, how you communicate, all those things. It's just gonna come back to, you know, they're gonna advocate for you when it comes to interview time and rank list time, all those things. They, they're gonna create a connection with you. So take the opportunity to do a different topic each time, every away rotation. I had a student come up to me for before their presentation saying, I haven't seen any crazy cases. And I think it's important to also feel that you don't have to find this really wild, crazy case. It can be a really, what we consider a simple topic, but you can really go through the differential. And so it could be, how do you diagnose acute versus chronic rhinosinusitis? And just going through, what are the key symptoms? How do you diagnose this? What do you look for in imaging? Because just working through even a common topic will show how much you've learned on the rotation. So again, I think finding a good mentor and if all you've seen is, you know, acute rhinosinusitis, that's okay. It can still be a really great and interesting presentation. It doesn't have to be this really rare case that, you know, they're going to write a case report on. I'm just curious for, um, sub I presentations at the end, are you guys typically having them just talk about a patient they saw or are they presenting their research? Because I like at UCLA, typically we'll have them do a research presentation. So then it's a little bit, it's not um, necessarily on a patient that they saw, but I'm just wondering what other places do. I think it's I'll institution just, dependent. I'll just say when students ask me, I, I recommend that they do a new topic as opposed to their research. It's great to learn about their research, but again, I, um, I'd rather have them you know, learn a new topic and talk about that as I detailed earlier. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of interact with the resident or faculty member or both you know, on that topic. So I prefer a clinical scenario followed with you know, the pathogenesis and treatment options. Yeah, and sometimes you don't know if, how many times they've given that research presentation before. And so it doesn't give you as much of an accurate view of how, you know, how they can learn on the fly and you know learn about a new topic too. So I totally agree with that. Yeah. Great. Thank you all for your responses. So kind of transitioning a little bit, um, something that comes up a lot towards the end of the rotation is requesting letters of recommendation 
from different faculty, faculty members. So I'd love to hear from our attending physicians. We can start off with Dr. Pott. What is the best way for students to go about requesting these letters? Well, attendees expect this and we're always happy to do it. And I think that going back a step before just the requesting is deciding who you're going to ask. You know, some people think, well, I need to ask the chair or I need to ask someone who's famous, world renowned so that their letter means more as opposed to someone who maybe is junior. And then there's another, another school which says, you really want the letters and the people who know you best who could write you the strongest letter. And I think that there's a lot to that. You know, a letter from the world expert that is a mediocre letter isn't gonna really help you. And, you know, the people you're asking are the people that you've worked with that know you best and that think very highly of you. Now, you don't have to ask for a letter. It's not a requirement of doing a way rotation. You can only have so many. And now the people are doing two. They make, it's not even a requirement that you get one from any away rotation. So you have to consider that you want one that's gonna be really strong. And if you're not sure, you can have that conversation. And I've had that conversation and so have, uh, other people in my department, you just say, I think I'd like you to write me a letter. Do you think you can write me a really strong letter? And attendings are honest and will tell you, most of the time it's yes, of course, but sometimes they're gonna say, well, you weren't the absolute best student, but I could write you a letter. And this is probably what it would sound like. And you can make a decision based on that. And so I think that selecting the, the person to write it is the most important thing. Finding someone that really knows you well, that thinks really highly of you, that you've performed exceptionally well with. And then when you go to ask them, most people ask in person. And I don't think there's anything bad about asking by email, but usually I have people ask me in person. And our department has a, a, a form letter that one of the coordinators uses that has all the information that we need, things like your personal statement, your CV, and everything that we need in order to make it a really strong letter, because that's what we're interested in doing. And so you, you can ask either way. You can ask in person, you can ask by email, but just make sure that you pick the right person who's going to write you this strongest letter. I'll just add, I, I agree with all of that. This, you know, the people that know you the best are going to write the best letters. So just make sure you think about that. Uh, for away rotations, uh, don't, you know, have hesitancy to meet with the program director, you know, early on in the rotation uh, to introduce yourself. I like meeting them. And so taking the time to do that. And then maybe at the end, if, if, if you uh, need a, a, you know, an away rotation letter because you don't have a home institution or you'd like one, we're certainly happy to do so. Come prepared with your, your personal statement, your updated CV. So you know, a good draft of your personal statement at this point, your updated CV and your grades. That's basically what I'd, I'd like to have. And I think most letter writers would like. And it sounds like some institutions have a form um, letter with all of that on there. So just think about those things, have to be prepared with that. Both Dr. De Silva and Dr. Plot made a really good point of having a personal statement ready, which I did not at the beginning of my rotation. And that was something that I knew that I'd have to figure out and how to put together because I still wasn't sure what to write about and was just really excited to see what my away rotations would kind of give me in terms of experience, thinking that it would help me write my letter. And I think that that was kind of a mistake. It ended up working out and I finished my letter before I asked for um, my letters, but it was really hard to work on my personal statement during an away rotation. So I would not recommend doing that. Definitely you can change it, but just having a nice draft before you ask for a letter by the end of your rotation is really important. And if I could do it over again, I would have made a draft that I felt was appropriate for letter writers. And then after my aways, then revamped it for my actual ERAS application, um, rather than having to stress about it during my first away rotation. I would also add that um, you can talk to the residents sometimes about who would make a good letter writer. If you're thinking of, you know, a few different people, I think it's certainly reasonable to ask the residents of that program, hey, like, do you think that this person would write me a good letter? Like, and sometimes the residents have an idea that like, no, don't, don't waste your time or yes, that, that person will write you a strong letter if they agree to write you a letter. Um, so don't be scared to kind of ask the residents for their feedback in general about letter writers. A little bit off topic, but um, 
We have the standardized letter of recommendation form. You can see it, what's asked on it on the, at the SUO website. So go feel free to take a look at that. Um, pretty much all the faculty across the country use the standardized letter of recommendation, but they also provide comments, sometimes just a brief paragraph, sometimes a full on uh, letter in addition to the standardized letter of recommendation. So you should kind of know, uh, since you probably will give up access to see your letter to your, your writer, um, you can at least see what the, what's kind of noted on the standardized letter of recommendation form that's on the SUO, the Society of University of Laryngologists website. And then, la sorry, just to, uh, don't mean to hog time, but I was going to add about personal statements. It's a personal statement. So don't just rehash your CV. We want to learn about you, like who you are, what made you, who, you know, what really made you into who you were today. And so um, I often give a lot of feedback on the personal statements. It makes, you want the, the reader of the personal statement to want to meet you. So we obviously know you from the rotation, but for future applications, it can be kind of the selling point for boy, I really want to meet this person in an interview setting. Uh, I'm excited about meeting this person. So have people read your letter or read your personal statement, have them review it, make critique it for grammar and all those kinds of things. Um, but I'd like to have a really strong personal statement to review before I write the letter. I talk yeah, I totally echo that too. It's, it's, really, it's really refreshing because the rest of the application is so kind of nuts and bolts and very, um, you know, kind of curated by Iris, this is really your only time to, you know, let us know who you are as a person. And so um, make use of that, you know, uh, talk about, you know, your family or, you know, a patient you saw that really triggered your interest or, you know, a hobby that you have done for a long time and you're really good at and passionate about. Um, any of those things are, are safe topics. Um, and just, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to relate them to otolaryngology either. <laughs> um, like it's, you know, we get letters every year about um, musicians and then they say, well, that's why I'm going into otolaryngology. And that's fine, that's great, but you don't have to tie you know, your, inter your inter interests outside of medicine into it necessarily. Um, but I, you know, those are the kinds of people who have interesting hobbies and interesting backgrounds that I want to talk to in an interview and could definitely make the difference between you getting an interview and not. I think we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but uh, really trying to address it early, both with your the potential faculty member and saying, you know, I'm really interested in a letter from you. What can I, what would your expectations be of me to get a strong letter from you at the end of this rotation? I think it can be helpful, but also having that conversation or identifying who it might be with both the residents and like the program coordinator, they might be able to make sure you have um, more opportunities to work with that, that faculty mentor. I know uh, my home program, our rotation director was great about, or asked us actually like, who do you think you guys are trying to get letters from and made sure that we got opportunities to work with, with that person. And then sometimes also when you're meeting with a faculty member at the end, talking about a letter or whatnot, you can also sometimes say, um, if you'd like to kind of hear more about my experiences on this rotation, I got to work a lot with so-and-so residents and they, they might be able to give you more information as long as the resident's okay with that. That can be another resource for the faculty member to be like, hey, um, what was what were your what were your thoughts about the this medical student? How did they do? Great. So we heard a lot of great tips on not only letters of recommendation but also um, personal statements. So that was really great. Um, we do have some questions that we have that came up in the chat. Um, so. One question that we got was, do you have any advice for how to quickly adapt to new healthcare systems during away rotations? Um, I'll open it up to anybody for this question. I think it is such a challenge to go to a new place, especially if it's in a different city, find a place to live, figure out how to get around town, get to work early, get your, credentials to be in the system. And then all of a sudden you're expected to you know, perform at the highest level. It's such a challenge. And I think that a great resource is for at least us is the residents, like the chief resident and the residents on service. They want you to succeed. They wanna help you in reaching out to them early to try to figure out you know, what are the tricks for 
succeeding, surviving in this system, it's a great resource. It's such a challenge. I've seen people succeed in it and sometimes it holds people back. But I think going to the residents and asking for all that advice of you know how to get plugged into the system up and running really quickly is helpful. I think just having a really good attitude and being comfortable with making mistakes and people correcting you, you just can't be offended. And people always appreciate it when you introduce yourself. So when, on, when you're on in a way saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a rotating medical student, I'm really interested in ENT, because whether it's you're introducing yourself to a circulator, they might not understand what an away student is, but saying, you know, I'm a fourth year medical student trying to go into ENT, I just wanted to introduce myself. And that makes a huge difference because then people aren't looking at you like, who is this random person that I've never seen before? And that's just a really good way to create rapport with the new people that you're working with at institution, not just the residents, but all of the healthcare staff. Great. So another question that we um, received was how this is a little bit of a um, unique situation, but how students can effectively reintegrate in their rotations and away rotations after coming back from a research year. I think it's useful if you do a research year to um, spend some time at the end of that, whether as a formal or informal rotation with your home program, if you, if you have one, um, or, you know, a program that you've had contact with before, because, you know, they, they already know you better. And so they're going to be a lot more kind of tolerant of mistakes and, and help you more get back into the swing of things when you've been out uh, clinically for a while. So I would try to do that instead of setting up an away rotation right after you come back from research. I have a question for the program directors. I want to know if this is true or not, but when I was applying for a ways, I was told that you had to be careful when you apply to a ways because if you get accepted to multiple institutions and then you decline and it's like an offer to do the away there, then you're blacklisted from potentially ever being interviewed at that program. Not true. I'm way too busy to even know who's applying and not coming. I don't even find out and I don't care to find out. Exactly. We just assume things come up. We, we don't take it personally. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, two years ago when the way rotations were canceled after people applied, I used the people who applied as a proxy for interest. That was before signaling. Great, thank you. And I know that's a question a lot of us have as well as medical students. Um, so a final question from our audience members. Um, how do we continue to show interest in a program after we've completed our away rotation? And I'll leave this open as well. I think it's kind of hard to do. I think, um, you know, uh, again, I, I think it's, we have some of the things coming out about signals soon, but uh, you're expected to not use a signal for your home institution or away rotation. So uh, hold off on sending a signal there. It's an implied signal that you did in the away rotation with us. So please don't waste that signal on that um, place you did the away rotation. Uh, if something significant happens and you develop a great relationship with your the program director, the letter writer, you know, send them an email and say, hey, I'm really excited to share with you. I got this paper accepted for publication or what have you. Otherwise, there's really no uh, necessary communication that you need. If the program offers some kind of meet and greet or some kind of virtual meeting, you know, uh, coming up in a couple months, um, certainly, you know, sign up for that and that's, uh, you may learn more about the program that you didn't see during the four weeks. Uh, but other, otherwise, there's not a whole lot that you need to do. Some programs uh, um, allow you to be involved in their didactics or virtual grand rounds, you know, for the rest of the year, you know, that's opportunity for you, but not expected, you know, outside of your four week rotation. So uh, certainly don't feel obligated. The only 
Uh, if you see an interesting case uh, during your sub I that um, you think is worthy of a case report, you could potentially talk to the attending about it um, and see if they would like you to try to write it up. And then that kind of, you know, that will be at least for the next couple of months, you'll be in communication with them. Don't do it just to continue emailing with that attending. But if it is um, some, like a really interesting case, then they'll just be excited about it. And um, it's a good way to then have a publication with that uh, attending. You can also stay in touch with the residents. I love hearing about where uh, medical students go. I ended up going to Academy last year and a lot of our away rotators actually reached out to me and said, are you here at Academy? And it was just a really fun way to catch up with people. And the residents matter. We wanna, you know, the faculty look to us to see, do we feel like this person fits in our program? We aren't necessarily involved with the interview process. Sometimes chiefs will be at certain programs, but our opinion does matter. You know, if we really like you, or on the other hand, we felt that you maybe weren't the best fit for our program, we will make our voice known to faculty because we are going to be spending 70 plus hours a week with you. So we do want to make sure that we get along. And I, I thought that was so cool that I was at Academy and I had a presentation and the away students saw that and they came to my talk. And I thought that that was really awesome that they did that. And I kept in touch with them. And to piggyback on that, always be nice to the program coordinator. Um, in our program, sometimes when we've got two candidates that we can't quite figure out where to rank, the program coordinator's input actually makes a big difference. Great, and now we're almost at the hour, so um, would like to take this chance to welcome any last tips or advice from all of our panelists for our medical students. I would just say this is an exciting time for everyone, for us and for you. And so take every day as a learning opportunity. You're not going to have another time in your life that's like this. So just cherish it. I know it's hard and it's stressful, um, but you know, just go with an open mind and be engaged and, and you'll really get a lot out of it. Think, think of every day as a learning opportunity. I think the most important thing is attitude. You know, you're gonna be on these rotations and no one has all the right answers, including the attendings and the residents and everyone makes mistakes and we're all on a learning curve. And it's the real difference is the attitude, you know, like except you won't know everything, but it's okay. You have a great attitude, you enjoy learning, you enjoy getting feedback, you enjoy helping your patients, that could really make the difference. And so just try to stay positive and enjoy this. These are your colleagues that you're gonna know and see the rest of your life. It really is a small field. And so even though it's stressful, try to enjoy it. The other thing is remember to trust your gut feeling during the rotation. So obviously it's a, it's a month long interview, but you're also interviewing them. And so, you know, if, if something feels wrong or off, try to figure out what that is. And so that you can use that in your future interviews to figure out what, you know, kind of environment you would thrive in. Yeah, I was just gonna echo what Dr. Platt was saying about attitude. I think, you know, the best med students that I've worked with are just the ones that are really excited to be there. And it makes our lives so much better because as a resident, it is a grind for sure. Um, so then to just have fresh med students coming in, super excited to be there, um, just wanting to learn and excite, you know, it's better to teach them. And um, that honestly, I don't really care if you don't know the anatomy or not, like you will learn it eventually. So what really matters is, do I want to work with you? Or are you going to be like a pleasant to be around, um, in my opinion? I think what Dr. Cabrera said is so important about interviewing programs. I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in trying to be really strategic about, well, I need an away at this program for this exact reason. And I did one program on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, because I was in the Midwest, and I just really wanted to experience really different programs. And one had in-call, in-house um, in call, one had home call, um, one was a really big program, one was not, one had multiple hospitals, one just had one. So for me, I really loved taking my aways to, first of all, live in really cool cities that I probably won't ever live in again, but also to just experience really different hospital systems to figure out what I wanted both for my training and then even into the future. 
I got a really good piece of advice when I was doing my OAs too. And it was that, you know, even if you don't end up choosing this program to go to, and away is an opportunity to network with residents, to network with attendings who will be future colleagues, you know, in the setting that you do match into ENT and end up practicing. Um, but these people will be in the field with you in the future. And so it's important to respect the connections that you're able to make on your away rotations and just have a good time and learn. I mean, if you truly want to do ENT and this is what you enjoy, then just see it as an opportunity to grow, to learn and to develop yourself, almost like leading into your intern year, kind of like a new opportunity you needed to learn and, um, and and just part of your ENT education. It's exciting for us to have uh, sub eyes. It's an opportunity for us to meet you guys. And it's exciting to think about who might be joining our team for the next five years. Um, so as it is a month long interview, but we want to get to know you. We want to know your personality. We want you to have fun. We want to have fun with you and um, really see if you, you know, we feel like if you, we want you to feel like you'd be good for our program and us feel like you'd be good for us. We really want to, you know, get to know who you are as a person and more than just work with you. So. Great. Thank you all for those final thoughts. And again, a huge thank you to all of our panelists for spending time with us today. Um, we really appreciate your advice and having gone through similar journeys that we're currently going through. So I know I will be taking a lot of these tips with me moving forward. Um, and we wanna thank our audience members for tuning in and joining us. Um, and with that, we can end our webinar. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone, take care.